So, folks, welcome to the most important chapter uh, that we're going to have all year. This is uh, stoichiometry. We've hinted at it a couple of times where we tried to come up with a balanced chemical equation and actually work some predictive numbers uh, throughout the equation. Uh, we saw that with Avogadro's law back in gas uh, quantities. Uh, we saw a little bit with uh, concentration of ions in the solutions, chapter 5. So we have had a couple of uh, previews for this. What we're going to do is just dive right in, but this is an absolutely fundamental skill. If we don't know stoic by the end of chapter 7, um, and we don't have full engagement into this uh, part of the chapter, Chemistry 30 is almost 100% stoichiometry. It's, uh, I can't see a student even being able to pass the course, let alone have any idea what's going on with it, if they don't know stoichiometry. So this is absolutely fundamental prerequisite skill. I need you guys to be putting in your maximum effort with this chapter, doing your best, trying uh, you know, a lot of the examples, making sure that you're checking in if something's going poorly to get what you need, and do your best with trying to learn this online, or at least learn it at home. We're not going to be dropping anything from Chapter 7, uh, right? There's no omissions in this one, so we will be doing all parts, so pay very close attention to that as well. Let's dive right in, okay? So what we want to do is talk about what stoichiometry assumes and is. So we start taking a look at our chemical equations, the products and the reactants that are listed to us as we undergo a chemical reaction. Uh, realize that they're only kind of a shorthand. They don't necessarily show us everything. Uh, things that we kind of leave in the background or will be putting into future stoic uh, problems down the road would be the conditions of the reaction, uh, such as pressure, since we know that has an effect in gas laws, temperature, which can affect gases and the abilities for things to react. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tell us how quickly things happen. If I write um, the reaction for the combustion magnesium, one that we did when you guys were still in the class, that one happens super fast, but it would appear the same thing if I wrote the equation for rust. Well, rusting iron takes weeks, months, or years. It's uh, not necessarily uh, illustrated in your reactions. Sometimes it ignores intermediate steps. Um, you may remember that from a Chemistry 10 lab where we were looking for, I think it was an ammonia or a Windex smell, and the reaction you did didn't necessarily produce that final product. We actually had many steps in there. And then it doesn't necessarily show us what is consumed or produced, but we will build upon this, and we will see this in our stoichiometric calculations. So in this, what we're going to do is make a few assumptions about our chemical equations. All right, we're just going to assume things for our purposes to make our lives a little bit easier, that your reactions are spontaneous, that if I give you reactants, boom, they make products, and they're going to be there, and that the reaction is done quickly so we don't have any real losses involved. Very important term I want you guys to know is that we assume that these reactions are quantitative. Now, this means that there are quantities that can be measured in there, but more importantly, it means that at least one of your reactants is completely used up. This is something later on we will talk about as a limiting reagent. It's like having two things in a reaction. Think about the fuel in your teacher's car. All right, I have two reactants for the combustion reaction I'm trying to use uh, in order to make my car run and move around. Well, the two reactants, if we simplify it, are the oxygen in the atmosphere and the fuel, or the octane in the gas tank. Which one do you think runs out first? Very good. It's got to be the fuel in the gas tank. It would be catastrophic if I used up all the oxygen in the atmosphere just to drive between here and the grocery store. So one thing is used up. Sometimes it's both, but there has to be at least one used up, and that is our basis for Chem 20 stoichiometry. Therefore, if it's quantitative, it can be considered stoichiometric, which means when you balance the equation, that governs the overall equation. For every four parts of this reactant, I might consume two parts of another reactant and then produce three parts of a product. So our balanced chemical equation comes back here again, uh, reaction types and all of that stuff. So there is some, uh, uh, some really important things to remember from Chemistry 10 and our Chem 20 review with respect to reaction types, 
being able to predict products, and then being able to come up with the right balanced equation. Okay, so it's now all come together. There's Everything is interrelated here. This leads us into something called net ionic equations. Uh, where we're going to start most of our uh, studies here is to take a look at solutions. If we were back in class, and I hate having to keep referencing that, uh, we would be doing a lot more reactions. And one thing that we would have started to figure out by now is that most of the labs that we could do would be labs involving aqueous solutions. It's one of the reasons why we call chemistry a wet science, because most reactions occur most easily in solution. Solids are fairly inert and non-reactive as a rule, and gases are very difficult to contain and collect and work with. So most of our introductory chemistry was taking place in solution. We have to remember that when entities dissolve, they will do one of two things. If they are soluble ionic, they will dissociate, and if they are soluble molecular, they have the ability to ionize. This means that we can have these particles create by their brand new ions in solution or just dissociate into the previously existing ones. When we take a look at our uh, solutions, uh, or pardon me, our reactions in solution, especially the net ionic style, what we're going to see here is we're going to study a lot of single and double replacement reactions. And what we're going to find is that the particles involved aren't necessarily everything that was dissolved into water. The reaction usually runs only between a few members of the things that existed. And so what we'll do here is we'll start to introduce this idea that not everything is involved in the reaction, that only some things are involved, and then we take this idea even further in Chemistry 30. We do this by looking at something known as a net ionic equation. For those of you that have had part-time jobs, um, you may notice a difference between the amount of hourly wages that you got but versus the total amount of money you took home afterwards. There was usually less. And so net kind of refers to like the net pay that you have. This is with all the other additions and taxes and fees and stuff that you have to pay. It's always, a, well, with respect to paychecks, it's always less than the uh, total amount of money that you technically earned with your hourly wage. So, net just means getting down to uh, the minimum. What is ultimately the reaction? What we'll do is we'll look at it uh, three ways. The first thing we will do is we will write the balanced chemical equation that you did in Chem 20 uh, review, or pardon me, Chem 10 review, and Chem 20. We call this the non-ionic equation. It is just the reactants, and if necessary, the reaction type and the products. So this is the same as any chemical reaction you've done uh, for your previous chemistry teacher or for me in the Chem 20 review. What we're going to do here is we're going to look for things that dissolve. And not only that, we're going to look for things for, uh, that dissolve and dissociate into aqueous ions. And we're also going to look for strong acids, which will ionize to produce other things. So we have to check our solubility chart for the ionic compounds, because if they dissolve, they will also dissociate. Strong acids, there are six of them that we learned in chapter six. And if we see one of those being dissolved, then we will see that we will get hydronium ions and the associated anion. Weak acids, compounds that aren't, or ionic compounds that aren't soluble, and water itself are written as is and do not change. All right, so what we're gonna see is one, two, maybe three things in our reaction have to be split up and shown as their new or previously existing ions. Because remember, I can't actually give you a glass of salt water, can I? Sodium chloride, or table salt, is an ionic compound of sodium ions and chloride ions. But sodium chloride dissolves, and when it dissolves, water pulls apart the sodium and the chloride ions into individual ions due to its polar nature. So actually, all I can do is giving you a sodium ion and chloride ion glass of water. The table salt actually completely disappears. So this is important right here. When you take a look at your original equation, what you will separate is strong acids into the H plus and the associated anion, and the soluble ionic compounds will dissociate. We don't separate, we just say they dissolve and get wet, is the weak acids, water, molecules, 
um, solids and your elements. So really easiest way to look at it is if I find soluble ionic compounds or strong acids, they get changed into their dissociative or ionized products. What we'll do now is we'll rewrite this equation with all of those changed parts, and we're going to look for things that did not change from reactant to product. For example, if I have sodium ions on the left, and I still have sodium ions after the reaction has produced products, chances are sodium ion wasn't involved because it didn't go through a change in state, nor did it go through a change in charge. So we just say it hung out and watched the reaction in solution, otherwise known as a spectator ion. Okay, we've got four good examples for us to do later on here on the page, and we'll practice writing all three types of equations. Just follow along. It builds from this idea here, and once you get it, it's a pretty easy idea.